All right, thank you for joining Greenwood Counselor Conversation. We have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Jenny Hall today, who is currently the director of the TRIO Educational Opportunity Center at the Utah Valley University. TRIO is a federally funded program designed to support and encourage degree-seeking, first-generation, low-income, and or students with disabilities who need academic and student development assistance. Dr. Hall has worked in a wide variety of programs in many different educational systems. She's worked in the Criminal Justice Center, a residential treatment center, an alternative high school, a charter high school, a traditional public high school, and now she runs a program at the university system um, in the Utah Valley University. Dr. Hall has the most expansive perspective on education in America of anyone I know. Last year, Dr. Hall published her research in a dissertation called Hope for the Hopeless, When College Isn't the Answer. In it, she explores the power of hope and how our current educational system promotes or fails to promote hope in students. She also researched how career counseling can promote hope in students in this study. We are so excited to have this conversation personally Beth and I have had the pleasure of working with Dr. Hall for years as she is a trained Greenwood system counselor. We've collaborated with her on a number of career counseling clients and have learned as much or more from her as I imagine she has gleaned from us. Dr. Jenny Hall, welcome to the Greenwood Counselor Conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's nice to be here. It's nice to see some people and meet new people always in this space. So thank you. We are also joined by other Greenwood system trained counselors who are invited to participate in this conversation. Um, if you would like to ask a question or contribute to the conversation, please feel free to put your comments or questions in the chat or raise your hand or turn your microphone on and, uh, and participate in the conversation, ask questions and comments. Before we jump in to the idea of hope and career counseling in education, I want, I was hoping that Dr. Hall would lay the groundwork for the conversation by first starting about, starting to talk to us about the evolution uh, and purpose and philosophy of education in America. Dr. Hall, could you please give us a brief history of the purpose of education in America leading <laughs> up to where we are now? Um, yes, I can, as I understand it. Um, I first was introduced to this um, this awareness about the education system by Jamie Vollmer. I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but he wrote a book called Schools Cannot Do It Alone. And he was a business guy who went in and was asked to kind of evaluate their education system from a business lens. And he kind of went in thinking like, well, if we just get qualified teachers and we do, you know, did all these things. And as he got in there and broke it down, he was like, Oh man, this is a this is a big thing. So he kind of has a really awesome timeline. So if you want to look at that, that's where I've taken it. My some of my information from. He's got a great printout timeline of like the education system, where it started, and kind of what's been added since its inception. But you're all probably familiar with the fact that education started off with wealthy people. It wasn't for everybody. At some point, they decided they should publicize, you know, make it public and available for everybody, which was, you know, great. And the intent was to kind of just do basic academic, basic reading skills. Um, they also felt it was really important to create citizens to continue the democracy. So there were components in that they felt would like make, you know, basically make people be able to be fit into the to the community and the things that they wanted. Um, it, since that time, it's just toggled back and forth. And Dan and I were talking about this this morning. It just and it continues to toggle back and forth based on the economy. Like, what is the job market, right? And so it's like, oh, now we need an influx of this. When I was in Oregon doing this dissertation, they had pilots who are forced to retire. You know, pilots are forced to retire, and nobody was there to take their place. <laughs> we had not been training. You know, pilots. Pilot is not a college degree. It is not something. And so there were this mass, this mass gap, this massive gap between you know pilots that we need, and we, for, you know, like yeah. Anyway, I could go on and on about the needs of of the of the different jobs we have in our company, but it's that right. There's this push and pull of like, oh, but now we need this, and now we need this, and so there's been a lot of conversations back and forth between like, should it be career focused? Like, how do we get people into the job? versus this academic, right? Are we academic and we go to college and, and all those kinds of things? So 
um, really the industrial revolu revolution is where it kind of started to split off. They needed people to go into the factories. So when they started to do this, this is from Sir Ken Robinson's work. If you're familiar with him, he's amazing. But he talked a lot about this too, right? It's like, if you, if you have a propensity for education, then go to the education track. If you don't at the beginning, then we'll put you into the factories. And really it hasn't changed much since then. Everything in the system wise of education is kind of that same track. Um, what happened though, um, is that in 2001, with no child left behind, it was no child left behind, which means the system that was once doing this is now doing this, but now they're trying to pull people over to the academic side, but the system is still gearing it this way. And so they put the responsibility on the schools for kids to be able to achieve by attaching money to achievement scores. So then it became on the schools to make sure they were doing everything they could do to get students to do that. In 2015, they had the Every Student Succeed Act. In 1994, they had the Goal Initiative. And the Goal Initiative, I think, sorry, going backward, 1994, really the Goal Initiative is really what made it college focused. So if we wanna talk about like, how did the college going culture really get um, inoculated into the system, it was that initiative because they put the standards testing in there, standards-based testing. And where did they take the standards from? college achievement tests. <laughs> How do you get into college? You take this test. Oh, then everybody has to have this level of education, right? And so uh, taking it from seniors in high school have to be able to pass this test. And if they're in 11th grade, then they have to have this knowledge, right? And all of that knowledge was building to that college level readiness. So if you think about that in 1994, everything since then has been college focused, whether or not they're calling it that, it's college readiness because of those initiatives. And then attaching funding to the schools is an interesting thing because as a school counselor, I actually worked in the prime of this No Child Left Behind thing. And it went from, you know, 70% graduation rates to 90. Do we think that that's because our education system got so much better at educating the students? <laughs> or was it, we will lose funding if we don't have our students graduate. So what can we do to help them get graduated? Now, that's a big old debate. I'm not, I don't wanna get into that necessarily because what does it mean to have a high school diploma has changed, the value, the meaning. I have several students who <laughs> did the Hail Mary at the last minute and got six credits and graduated. Like oh, you did work study for this thing? Ah, oh, that sounds like that fit this credit, right? And I'm not opposed to it. I think if we have a, a key <laughs> that people need to be successful, then they need that to be successful. Um, and if it, I don't know. So anyways, this, it, it just, it complicates the system. If, you, if you, you get where I'm going there, it complicates the system and it kind of skews how we're seeing students and how we're educating students. So in my opinion, and in my experience, that's kind of the, the purpose of the school. Tangent there, <laughs> Now schools are the healthcare system, they're the, they're the mental health, there's social workers in every school now, there's counselors in school, like mental health counselors in schools, academic counselors in schools, um, there's food pantries in schools, access to food now, free and reduced lunch during COVID, everybody, you know, so it, the system is, if you're talking about what its purpose for, the educational part is there, but now it's also full of all of those other resources, it's the hub for like everything, so schools are, they're big, I mean, their job is big overall, so. That's my my brief understanding, but I really recommend Jamie Vollmer's book on that stuff because he really he really ties that down. Yeah, I, I think the mission creep um, is a real phenomenon in the education because it's the place in which the society and and government interact in a very intimate way, and the um, the idea of actually educating parents alongside the child and giving child services and making health care available within the school because we know that's where they're going to be and, and feeding them. Um, so it definitely has evolved over time. And I know that school administrators talk about how education is now just a part of the job as opposed to all these other things. And as a school administrator, I remember asking my science teacher to be mentor, you know, to the students and, and have advisories groups. And, and these teachers are looking at me like, <laughs> I teach science, you know, you want me to do what? <laughs> um, but we're, we'll put a put in that and, and talk about this college going culture, this college for everyone. And um, so we're now focused in, and we've lined up the, um, requirements for funding to be consistent with going to college. So how does that work? How does that serve the general population where before you talked about there being more different avenues of success and then how No Child Left Behind kind of forced everyone into one funnel? Um, how has that served the population? 
You know, it's it's interesting in, in talking about this because as a school counselor, my, I mean, I was the one who like left the criminal justice system to go to the education system because that's where your kids would be. Not because I was passionate about education, but I knew they would be there for all the reasons that Dan just said. And it's like, I, I you say that and I start tracking back individual students, right? Like I can go back to those individual students. And I remember the moment that I was talking to a student and, you know, life circumstances, just general intellect, like ability to learn, um, plus life circumstances. And I remember having this epiphany of like, oh my goodness, it's like asking me to be a ballerina. Like I'm not flexible. I don't have rhythm and I don't have coordination. And you're asking me like, if I had to be successful as a ballerina to survive in life. And so you start there. So I don't know, choose all of you kind of choose something <laughs> that you're like, I'm really not good at that. Like I know by this time in my life, I cannot actually do that thing. And so it's like, picture yourself in that moment. And you're like, okay, this is the goal. This is what I have to do to achieve in life. And you're like, okay, I'm going to try to do this. And you start to fail and you're like, oh, I can't, I can't change my range there. And then they're like, no problem, we got you. We're gonna give you this special class, right? And the special class is gonna impact you here. And you're like, great. And you get in there and you start doing it and you still can't change. Like you still can't flexible, you still can't do those things. And it's like, okay, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. We have this other thing and we're gonna bring your parent in over here now. And we're gonna try this other thing. Like how many interventions before you're like, look at how much they've thrown at me and I still can't do it, right? So. I love the education system for the reason of like, we want to try to help you and we can get creative. People got really creative and we're doing all these things to try to help them at the end of the day, though. Didn't change life circumstances, <laughs> didn't change their uh, um, some of their academic, just general academic abilities um, and all of those things. So for me, the mental, I feel, I feel the most connected to the mental punishment that I think that it had on those students and kind of working with them and trying to, I, I spent a, a lifetime in my career trying to undo that right? Trying to undo that they are valuable, that they're not valuable unless they can to no, you're valuable. That doesn't matter, right? Let's move on. Like, don't, you don't have to do that thing. There's a billion things you could do in your life. And so that's actually when I stumbled upon the career, the career assessment, I was doing basically the career assessment model without the assessment piece. And it would take six months to eight months for kids or students to believe me when I was like, I promise you have worth. I promise there's more in you. Like, let's look at all these other things, but building that trust versus the assessment was like, Oh, this is awesome because this is a mirror like this is reflecting back to you cool things about you that I'm not you don't have to believe me look you you said it you did it this is a reflection so I really loved it for that reason but if you're asking me the mental part really really was with the painful part for me um the system got good like I said at throwing credits at kids and getting them graduated and like whatever but at the end of the day they still left not knowing about themselves, what they were good at, knowing what they weren't good at type of thing. If you just look at statistics, this was my favorite thing in my dissertation. <laughs> it was like breaking down, if you take 10 students, how many of them go to college and, and then how many of them graduate, you know, how many graduate high school, how many go to college and how many actually complete college. It's like 30%. So 30% are graduating college. And if that's the case, and we have them for 13 years in the school system, we're only serving 30%. We're really only serving 30% if we're focused on college. So that was my breakdown of what if we were to like shift the system and do something that actually like fit all 100% because every single one of them is going to leave and have a job, every single one of them. So what if we did a better job at like educating them on that? But sorry, Dan, I'm probably going into a different territory, but mostly no. for me, I really connected to the mental hardship when I really got to know those students. And of course that behavior looked different for every teacher and every principal, but as a counselor, I got to see the, the, the pure part, right? The... I'm a failure and I'm not succeeding part uh, that did gets demonstrated in different ways in a school, you know, <laughs> class count, class count, class, class clown, you know, behavior problems, you, you know, whatever. But when I got to meet with them, it was always this like, well, I'm not good at anything anyway. I'm not like, what's my point? Right. Um, but then you do have the statistics showing that they're not. When I was in Oregon and I did my dissertation there, it was like, I can't remember, Dan, it was like, it was like half a million 16 to 24 year olds in Oregon, which isn't a huge state, half a million were not in school or work. That's 500,000 people just doing nothing. And I mean, that that's the stuff that starts to hit me. I'm like, oh, we got to do better. So yeah. it, it sounds like you're saying that um, this college going culture serves 30% really well because they actually achieve that goal. And so they, they, they get to the, to the finish line you know, of, of the 13 years preparing them for college, they go to college and, and then actually 
uh, matriculate from college. And what you're saying is this other 70% are not well served by that system because they feel as though they didn't cross that finish line. They didn't, they didn't achieve the goal that they were being prepared for for those 13 years. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think everybody here would probably agree. Most people leave high school and they know about themselves if they can do math or not, if they can write something and like if they have friends. Like that that's really kind of the out I see the biggest outcome if you ask a student about high school. It's like those are the things they know about themselves. And they it's a gaping hole of what they know about themselves. That's I think that's where I focus more on like and rather than if they achieve the goal, it's like they've left here not knowing anything about themselves because all they know is college. Like if they can fit college or not. Like that's the mirror that's reflected. Jenny, I have a, a, a just, Dan, if I might, a quick, inter, a quick interjection, because you mentioned Oregon several times. I'm on my local school board in Oregon, have been for over 12 years, so I've been tracking this conversation. At one point, the instinct in Oregon, top-tier leadership versus grassroots movements, where our Governor Kitzhopper had this 40-40-20, so yeah. The, yeah. the natural attempt was Okay, 25, 30 for percent, or if you're as you're describing, let's go for 40 percent. And it was counterintuitive. And then along came the grassroots movement, where for the first time since statehood in 1859, a measure passed in every single county, 36 counties in Oregon, to directly fund career and technical education. So what's curious to me, and as you're describing this, is people know leadership often tends to be out of sync, the Department of Education, with just parents and their sense of what direction we need to move in. And it sounds like you've been able to follow that as well. It, and it's funny what, when you say that, because I grew up in Utah and I worked in Utah. I did my doctorate in in Oregon. So then I got to see Oregon system. And it was really, I mean, so my first policy paper that I did in my program was based on Oregon stuff, because the cool thing about Oregon is you actually have a career credit embedded in your graduation requirement. Like you have to have a half a credit of career credit. So I mean, which was beautiful for me. Like, oh my gosh, and my job was actually the career to school counselor. So like, I love that job, right? Cause I never worry about school. I got to connect them to career stuff. But then when I did the hours like spent <laughs> on that, even, even a career credit, the hour spent was 40 hours at like being really, really generous, 40 hours in four years on intentional career activities. 40 hours and four years of education. But I was like, but it's still in there, you know, that thing. And I know maybe you know this, but right before COVID hit, they actually had uh, my person, my program was assistant superintendent. So she was going to this meeting, but they were going to read, they were going to redo the graduation requirements. There was a big meeting to redo the graduation requirements. And then COVID hit. And of course that got tabled. <laughs> so I, don't, I hope they come back to that in Oregon, but that's always my thing. Like if you really go back to it, it's not just like <laughs> academic standards. It's like, what really matters and being taught like and I we're losing kids in like ninth and tenth grade because school isn't relevant they have access to the internet and educate like it's just it's not relevant but anyway that's a total tangent. So yes I do know about the 40 40 20 yes yeah. so in your research you um talked about uh Snyder's work and hope and I, I'm hoping that you can kind of tell us a little bit about that and how that connects with your work we, we've heard about the 70% of the population who's not being well served, the 30 that are, what did you find when you looked at hope in the educational system? Okay, so a really, really simple, because it's a really quite complex theory, but a really simple breakdown is this. You have, well, I loved it actually. How Snyder came up with this is he went and interviewed a bunch of people and what he found that everybody thinks about the future. It's innate, like it's this thing that we've done forever because we want to survive. So we think about the future. So we get a thing in the future that we look at and then we try to create a pathway to get to that thing in the future, right? We, we have plans. We're like, okay, I need to get food. This is what I'll do. Like that we naturally and instinctively do that. So first just know that about ourselves. We are innately thinking about our future and, and then how to get to that future. So he kind of pulled that apart and then did a bunch of research on that. And what he found was, you have a goal and then you have a way to achieve that goal. And then he has this other component he calls agency thinking. That's a confusing word to me. I just translate it into motivation. Okay. If you break down motivation though, motivation. Um, and I like this because he talks about hope more as like a cognitive thing than an emotional thing, but we like, we feel hope, but it's really based on a cognitive process. You have a goal, you have a pathway, and then this motivation. And he, he breaks down the motivation into a couple of different things, but I like this to simplify it. It's a belief in the ability to accomplish the goal. 
Okay, you have to have that belief in the ability to do it. That ability can be personal. That can be that, like that goal is yours. It can be that that pathway will get you there, right? So he, he clarifies hope is different than a dream because a dream is just out there. It's not connected. You're not thinking necessarily about pathway, but a goal is like a directed thing where you're like, oh, there's this pathway. I can see that I can do that pathway. And I believe in my ability, that pathway will get me and my ability will get me to that. So that's kind of the, the to me, the simplest way to describe Hope's, Hope Snyder, uh, Snyder's Hope Theory. Um, what that looks like in the education system, as we kind of already talked about, the second they come in, the goal is given to them. That, that's that's the standard. It's, it's every parent-teacher conversation is if you're able to be academic or not, right? We're not in there talking about if your kid is a really good friend to somebody and how amazing that is, and they're probably going to fit really well in the helping profession. Like, we're not doing that in kindergarten. Where, where's their reading level? Where's their math level? Where's their whatever, right? So they get in, and we have this standards-based thing, and we have these conversations around college, and everybody's like, okay, academics is my way to get to my goal, which is college. And it's one of those reciprocally bad things if you don't do well at it or if it doesn't make sense because then you have like these double hits right also you don't believe in the pathway I can't do college if I can't do high school right if I can't I can't actually do the college thing if I can't do high school so the pathway gets broken um and then you have that I don't believe in myself I don't have the abilities or the skills to get there even if I do make it to college if I do graduate because that's what I'm supposed to do right what's my skill base I can't do math I can't, can't go to college I can't do math right? So you have this whole breakdown of what that looks like. If you're good at it, though, man, we've done a really good job. Like we've shot hope. And that's what my research showed. We've shot hope out the window, right? Like if my goal was college and I met that goal, man, I have hope. I have tons of confidence in myself. I have confidence in the pathway. I can go to college. I can be successful, like all the things. Unfortunately, though, that fits 30%, right? We're reading 30%. So it leaves us in so I would say it's not like the middle, the middle area there of students who like try college and don't go to college. Like I don't feel like they're as hopeless and that didn't come up in my research either, but it's really the, it's really the others who are like, what well, I can't do anything with my life. I can't do school. That that's really the outcome that was kind of connected there. Um, did that answer your question, Dan? <laughs> It me I mean, it's measured by, and there was, there is a hope, there's a hope trait, right? And then there's a hope state. And and, and he has some scales that, that measure for that. And so he did that. When I did my dissertation, I used that to show, basically, I had, thank you to Oregon for having the career credit, and thank you to my school district for requiring the survey as a part of their career credit. No thank you to COVID, because that was when I was doing my dissertation. So I lost a lot of students, which meant the students who are not probably paying attention were also the students who I wanted to survey. But in that, um, what I ended up doing was taking hope scores and finding those with low hope scores and low achievement and then doing the intervention with them. So they had low hope connected to low achievement and then doing an intervention. When I did post um, my intervention, though, I went back to Snyder's original research on hope and used qualitative language. So I watched language pre-intervention and language post-intervention to see if they had shifted how they talked right how they believed um for themselves so that's kind of a, another piece of that so if you take hope as an indicator of future success would you say that um, those that are more hopeful are also more successful i mean that would intuitively make sense okay um, it's it's really complicated, right? Because you have like past successes that build on hope and then like the resilience factor. So all of those students, and this is a really good example. I'm actually doing the Greenwood system with the student right now who breezed through, college, through high school. He's brilliant. Like he is just brilliant. Breezed through high school. Hit college, which required some study skills, some study habits, like all of the things. He can't do it. He's like, I never developed those skills. I didn't need to. I remembered everything when I was sitting in my high school classes, right? So right now he doesn't feel hopeful, like, right? So it's a, there are barriers and things that come up that can knock down that, that hope or, you know, circumstances. So, I mean, intuitively, yeah, if you have hope, you'll find more success. I mean, you, you're happier. I mean, there's lots of research attached to hope. So that's a whole, a whole thing. Okay. So you touched on it briefly. But um, in, in your last answer about how you can provide hope to students and the name of your dissertation, you know, hope for the hopeless um, when college isn't the answer. So how is it that you found through your research that career counseling provided students with hope when college wasn't 
the answer? Um, yeah, and I kind of talked about this too because my years as a school counselor was just trying to negate what everybody else was telling them their future was based on, which was their academic abilities, right? And so what I what I did was I set it up in such a way that I took those low hope, low achievers, and I had um, a school staff who who works with that age group, the seniors. Um, there's in I don't know if this is for where you are. That, that age group, every grade grade has one. And so um, I had her do the Greenwood Systems process with these students. Um, and she did an interview pre, and then she, which I put together. And then she did the assessment and conversation. And then she had a pre, a post interview. Um, and then I took the language from the pre and I compared it to the language of the post. And um, I mean, honestly, I cried. <laughs> I cried because these students went from like, I'm just going to do construction, right? What are you going to do after high school? I'm just going to do construction. Insert Greenwood Systems process post response. I think I'm going to own my own construction business. Like confidence, right? In in the energy, in the language I'm going to versus I, I guess I'll just, um, or um, I'm going to work um, for a daycare because I, I don't know English that well to I didn't realize that my translation skills <laughs> would be valuable <laughs> in the world of work, right? Like this, this is language from I, 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 because I can't, or because I don't have, or because I'm this, I won't, and I, and I can't to, I, I can, I will. There's this other possibility. I can own my own business. Oh, I didn't realize I could do this. And so that's what I really targeted was that self-awareness. So really trying to, to help them see themselves and also see Thinking about academics, which is what I love about the Greenwood system, it doesn't talk about that. It asks you what you want to attain. It's not even saying you have to go to college. It's like, well, what? Just so I can categorize careers, you know, where where do you want to be? And that was a really a really cool moment for me. And I think since then, and I was talking to Dan about this earlier, and I've got a son who just through high school had to worry about a whole bunch of other things, and graduated high school last year and left. I was like, I don't know who I am. I'm like, right, <laughs> here we go. Like, what do you want to do? It's like, I want to be a man. I don't know. I think I have good leadership skills. Awesome. Go ask for you know, a leadership job at Starbucks, which he did do. And then became in six months later was like, I don't think I want to do that. I'm like, but you could. Right. And he's like, yeah. So, you know, having these conversations for him, he didn't not only not have a goal, he also didn't know who he was. Right. So my dream intervention, if you were to ask me my dream intervention for the school system <laughs> would be kind of like I said, in kindergarten, they come in and there's a whole slate. I mean, like a strengths finder person. Right. There's a whole slate of things that kids kind of get that we're talking about that are categorical, that are about them as humans, their personalities, their talents, their traits that we start picking up on. And those parent teacher conferences are your kid was the most friendly kid like this whole two, 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 two months. They're the person who's been this and this and this. And that's fantastic. Da, 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 da. And they're doing this. And I'm not saying not talking about academics, but like filling in these gaps. And in sixth grade, they were the leader in our class. They took over. They did this thing. Or in fourth grade, they are the funniest student in my class. <laughs> right. And teaching them how to harness, harness that comedy. Everybody loves comedy. Everybody loves comedy. And in schools, we go like this, you know, we stuff it down. And they get in trouble and they get sent to the office for it versus, you know, helping them find ways and maybe to connect to it. So my dream would be that we put in these, these like, just like, I don't know, I can't remember what they call them here, but, you know, sort of these, these portfolios that move with students through their school age where the strengths are getting picked up on and they're going to show different strengths at different times based on different teachers and different, you know, things that they do and things they're interested in are coming up and that just kind of get attached to this portfolio that just goes with them. So by the time they leave, they've had all this reflective time to know more about themselves than just their academics. So if you ask my dream, that's that's kind of my dream. Lots of schools have done things like create career academies. California is really big on career academies and they've really gone that career route. So if, so if they have to have an English class, if they're in a career academy and they're studying mechanics, then their writing or their English stuff is based on cars and it's based on things like that. So they've really tried to take like the relevant topic stuff and create that. So, I mean, there's lots of people being creative with how to still you know do those kinds of things but um yeah so that's my my dream world did i answer that dan yes and kate has a question Let's see yeah oh can't hear you can't hear you 
Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, with regard to the career piece, what I struggle with are parents who are afraid that their child will be pigeonholed. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to that, if you, if, you, if you understand what I'm talking about and if you, if you find that. So my parents are like, I don't want, the first reaction when I talk to parents of say high school students I work with, when I bring this to them to, for example, one student, one particular student I'm working with right now, brilliant, is doing nothing in school, is very bored by school, is very de a little depressed too. That's being addressed. Um, I would love her to, to have that assessment. And I, and I talk to her about it and I talk to the mom about it, but the, the mom is afraid that, it's a little bit afraid I think that it would entail not going to college, which is a hard sell in this area. And I wonder if you could speak to that reaction. Whew, I feel like y'all are probably a little bit better at that than I, I might be. I think what I love about the career assessment is that it's not just a result. My favorite part of the career assessment is the conversation around the result, right? So one of the very first times I actually got to do this with a student, um, and he's just he's just kind of a punk, good kid, but super punk, right, in our launch program. And he, we got the results back, and I think that I told you guys about this. We got the results back. I reviewed it with them. I sat down with him, and we went through it, and I talked about his personality. We talked about all the things. And then in the end, he saw his results, and he's like, so... Jenny, why wasn't police officer on here? And I was like, do you want to be? And he was like, well, yeah, I kind of want to be that, that cop that shows up at the school and tells the kid to knock it off and like clean their life up, you know, and all that stuff. And I was like, okay, okay, I see where you're coming from. I said, well, let's look at your results. And he went back to his results. And I'm like, you hate structure. You hate rules. I love that you want to do that, but you would, you would be fighting with your uppers constantly. Like you would be miserable. Like that would not be a good fit for you. Right. Like, I love that you want to do that, but how would you bridge that gap? Right. Then, then we led into like this whole other conversation about like bounty hunter, right. You want to go find bad guys. You want like this whole thing. And there aren't rules. There are not rules. Right. So I, I like it because it's the conversation. It isn't a pigeonhole um, in the work I do right now. Sort of like Dan said, like I work with outside folks to try to get them connected to opportunities to get better skills and education those kinds of things and our grant wants them to go to college so that's always in the back of my head because I got a report on that but my segue in is like what skills do you want right what, what do you want to be what's your field what's your area what's your interest and then it's like if you do this cert that's fine and also if you want there's these other things too right so it's never a standalone I I, I never have it as a standalone conversation it's more of like a that's why I like the system because it's the conversation, it's helping them understand themselves. And these are the options, right? And because they have all the options, it doesn't have to pigeonhole to college or not college. That, I mean, that's how I use it though. Did that answer that? And I think that the other piece of it is that you're, you're doing this testing to really look at what the capabilities are of a, of a child. And if it points to college is not a good option for them, then they're probably gonna be in that 30% that you talked about. Um, so, you know, it's just when, you know, parents ask me, well, is my kid going to have to go to a therapeutic boarding school after wilderness? Well, I don't know yet. We're assessing this. And if it points to, yes, they're going to need something afterwards and you want to bring them home, it's probably not going to be a good option for them. So anyway. Yeah. And, and it is, it is hard. Cause, and this is your fight. Like you said, like Rosa, we're fighting a culture. Right? We're fighting a pretty privileged and dominant culture, right? And not only that, we didn't even talk about this, right? I was just looking this up. I was at the Council of Education Conference, National Conference last week, right? And it's like still education pays. More education equals more money. And if you look at the stats, sure enough, that's true. But like what's driving that? What's driving that? What's driving that is our, our economy is paying people in certain positions and for certain skill sets that we're driving that and education is not it's like education is not driving that decision it's not like if we take everybody and we give them education i was telling dan earlier i looked up a thing in utah but in 10 years we will have over graduated 16 000 people in utah like over graduated there will not be jobs in their field in bachelor degrees 16 000 that's just in utah in 10 years we'll over 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 educated and that's still at 30 percent that's not even assuming that more than 30 30 graduate 
So yeah. if, our, if you have to look at like our job market and our economy, that's what drives what pay is. It's not education. We're driving what, what jobs we value for money. Well, that was another thing that jumped out at me in your dissertation. You referenced the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2021 that referenced that only 31 or 33 percent of the jobs require a bachelor's degree in our economy, which, um, you know, and if we're trying to get everyone educated with a college degree to then all compete for only 33 percent of the jobs. There's another mismatch in, in the statistics as we go forward. Jenny, I want to go back to your um, non-academic characteristics profile that you would track. <laughs> now, obviously, that would be towards a certain end, right? You'd be keeping track of this and celebrating and um, building this portfolio of non-academic characteristics of a student. But what, what would be the end goal for that system? Honestly, my end goal is self-awareness. <laughs> Our economy changes, we change, our life circumstances change so much that I think like trying to identify like the career, the one thing doesn't feel like a valuable goal to me so much as like knowing who you are and knowing how to navigate that, knowing how to navigate the world of work um, is way to me significantly more valuable just because of life circumstances changes and the economy changing. So that that's my personal drive for it is literally as simple as self-awareness. But it's not to say it couldn't be different, but that's my that's my my drive for it. So if college for all, college going culture is the current mantra, what would you supplant that mantra with? What would be your term? College for any, but not all. College for any, but not all. Yeah, I had this conversation with my vice president when I got hired here and I was giving him my whole spiel and he was like, why did you take this job? Like, so I'm at a college, right? He's like, why did you take this job? And I was like, oh, well, because I believe anybody should be able to go. I mean, there are statistically like left out and forgotten people who don't have access to college that are capable, right? And need the supports. They're first gen, their family's low income. They don't have supports. They don't have people in their life telling them. So I'm like, oh, I get to pull those people in. I get to pull that group in, right? And that's beautiful. Like that is amazing and fun and wonderful. So that's why for me, it's like college for any, anybody can go, anybody who wants to, right? And, and has skills or determination or whatever, we can, we can help you do it. But I would say not for all. And I think UVU is particularly good at offering trades and certificates and associates degrees and certifications um, more so than your typical liberal arts college in New England. Wouldn't you say that's true as well? Oh, 100%. And in addition to that, when they get here, there's a million services to help them succeed. Right. So it's an open enrollment. They, they're one of a very few colleges in this in the whole country that have stayed dual dual mission, which is community college and like masters and bachelors. So they're one of the only ones who's done that because they are true to their mission that if you want to come, not only can you with open enrollment, we have supports to help you do it. Right. Then one of my programs is one of those things. So it's like, it's just that it kids, people come in and it's like, what do you need? How can we support you? We have free childcare on campus, like whatever. Like we really, I don't know. They, I work at a really, I'm privileged. <laughs> I'm privileged to work at a, at a college campus that believes that and supports it. Not only do they say come, they say come and we'll help you. Right. Yeah, I'm lucky. I think you go ahead, Phyllis. Did your research include people with learning challenges as well? Because we know, you know, people that have like, you know, different kinds of um, disabilities. And because we know that there are high rates of failure not only in college, but then there's also a lot of barriers to employment for that population as well. Yeah, and you know, I it I love that question and I did not like parcel that out. So I can tell you that it was a part of their graduation requirement to take the survey. Um, and so of that group, it went to all of the seniors in that school district. And you know, I had 840 respond. And sadly, and I'm saying this sincerely, sadly, I did not parcel that out at the time. I did not. Yeah. I wish I had, though. Good question. Thank you. I, I can speak to it personally, though. Like, I have two kids on the autism spectrum <laughs> who are 23 and the hardest workers that you'll ever, ever meet in your whole entire life, and they will never be paid for their hard work. And it is devastating to me because they cover shifts for everybody. They show up early, like they are on it. 
and the only way for them to make more money is become managers. And guess what? They can't do. They can't manage people. They can't make critical decisions. They get flooded. They get overwhelmed when stressful things happen. And it is is very frustrating. Yes. So. Yeah. Sales. So lucky to have a mom like you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? This has been this has been fantastic. I, I really appreciate your uh, research, Jenny, and and showing how the current educational system leaves a lot to be desired. I love your vision for um, a, a more inclusive system that helps students understand who they are upon graduation, which can then give them more hope because they can identify goals which they can know that they can achieve because we're celebrating their personality and their particular set skill sets and not just focusing um, exclusively on the academic capabilities of each student for the sole purpose of graduating from uh, higher education in four years with a bachelor's degree. And thank you for also talking about how career counseling helps with that self-discovery process and that identification of a goal and then through the action plan development creating um, the pathway that you're talking about and with that goal and the pathway comes the motivation to achieve that where without the pathway and without the goal the motivation is is hard to come by because they're not sure in what direction to focus their attention so i think you've brought really uh, this is wonderful research, and what I will do is take her dissertation and post it into um, the Greenwood System portal so that you all have access to it and can download it and read it. It was surprisingly uh, entertaining as a dissertation um, because you really did a great job of making it read like um, something very interesting rather than a lot of dense data. Um, so uh, I, I would encourage you all to to go in and grab it and, and get into the finer details of exactly what questions they ask to determine if a student has hope and um, the, and the methodology used to, uh, to identify the difference from pre and post. So thank you very much, Jenny. Um, thank you all for being part of this. Um, I, I look forward to seeing you guys again at the next Career Counselor Conversation. And Jenny, we hope that you continue your work and make this college for anybody, but not for all, a reality. Thank you. I hope you all do too. And I, like I said, I love this assessment so much. Um, I would do it for my full-time job, but I don't know how to find people. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you all have that privilege and stuff you do, but man, I, I, I love it so much. I think it's, I think it's, life-changing so thanks for having me and thanks I, like i said good luck to you all it's, it's awesome so thank you jenny it was nice seeing you again yeah and andrew if you find out you want to do this again like you can you it would be really fun to do this not covid years and kind of look at, at the results on this stuff because i really those were the kids who weren't coming those were the kids who were not connected the kids who that i wanted to study really didn't get connected to this study so when you go through and read the results like that's my biggest limitation the population that i really really wanted to target with this what were not around unfortunately yeah. so i kind of if if it makes sense and you're in the area go to hillsborough and say jenny hall did this thing <laughs> can you please send this <laughs> out again and see if we can get different results for it but Anyway, it was really nice to see you, Reed. Good to meet everybody. Thanks again, Dan, and hopefully we'll chat with you guys again. Thank you. Take care. Bye, guys.